Hi, thanks for watching this message. Here at New Life Church, we believe the Word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. We hope you enjoy the sermon. Verse here in Romans 16 that just jumped out, jumped out at me, and I wanted to share this with you uh, this evening. Um, and, and what'll happen is when, once we're done taking a look at the scriptures, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to do something very, very, uh, very specific for us tonight. And I want us to be prepared to respond. And here's why I, I say that. At the beginning of uh, this verse, verse 19, in Romans 16, uh, Paul, the apostle, writes, for your obedience, everybody say obedience. For your obedience has, come, has become known to all. So he's talking to the church there in Rome, and he's saying, you have a reputation. And your, the reputation that you have is that you're obedient to your Savior, that there's a spirit of obedience about you. And it's caught of course, it always catches God's attention, but it's caught the attention of others. They've, they've noticed that no matter what it costs you, you're obedient. You say yes to God. You respond to Him. And the reason why I'm mentioning that now before I get into the main part of the verse is because the, the, um, what, happens, what happens for you and I today, tonight, hinges on our obedience. It always does, and, and it's true this evening, that what I receive from the Lord tonight, what I receive from the Lord tonight hinges on my obedience to Him tonight. That as He speaks to me, whatever area of my life He highlights, touches, wants to deal with, challenges me in, exposes, reveals to me. And everything he says to me and what he whispers in my ear, what he speaks to my heart in those areas of my life, everything hinges from that point on on how I respond to him in my obedience to him. And you've heard me say this before. I'll repeat it in the context of this evening. But what's on the other side of my obedience is victory. What's on, the, uh, what's on the other side of my obedience at any time is healing. It's strength. It's comfort. It's hope. Amen? At the end of this uh, passage here, this chapter, Paul says that Jesus will, will crush Satan under your feet. Well, that's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is with you, but he says, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. I like that image. How about you? I don't like the devil. I don't like what he does. I don't like the chains of the enemy, right? And, and so the promise that Paul's giving them is that the God of peace will come and he'll come short, shortly, not very long, and he's gonna, cut, he's gonna crush Satan underneath your heel. In other words, he's gonna give you victory. But that victory is a result of the first part of that verse, which is our obedience. So tonight, there is amazing victory for many of us in this room. But that victory is found on the other side of our obedience. So I, I just want to ask you, will you be obedient tonight? Will you be obedient to respond to him? If he, call, if he pulls on you, if he calls you, if he wants you, if he calls you to come and get prayer or come and just kneel here or, or, or to go through the waters of surrender and baptism and be washed from, washed from your past, will you be obedient? If he, if he touches an area of your life that maybe you didn't even realize you were holding on to. Will you be obedient to give that to him, to release that to him tonight? Because if you will, God will crush Satan underneath your feet tonight. There'll be victory there tonight. Yes. And so here's the part of the verse that really struck me, though. It says, uh, therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. He says, but I want you, and, he, and here, here it is, I want you to be wise in what is good 
and simple concerning evil. I want you to be wise regarding what is good, and I want you to be simple. I want you to be simple concerning evil. What does that word simple mean? It's not, that's, that word simple isn't, make, it's not referencing our intellect or, or our ability to comprehend things or it's not, that word is not the same word that, you know, somebody, well, he's kind of simple, he's kind of slow, he's kind of dull. Maybe mentally he's not, he's, you know, he, he has difficulties or whatever. That's not what that word means. Paul says, I want you to be simple. That's such a beautiful word. Simple concerning what is evil. That word simple means free from impurities. Just like the impurities that you would find in metals. It means to be free from those impurities. It's without, and so in this context, it's, it's talking about being simple without the mixture of evil. In other words, there's not, there's not us being wise regarding what's good, with, but kind of mixed in the good is this stuff that doesn't reflect or represent heaven, doesn't, resent, uh, doesn't represent the kingdom of God, doesn't represent God. There's there's something evil, there's something contrary to the goodness of God, to the holiness of God, the righteousness of God. So that's what he's saying, I want you to be simple. Another, another word that you could interchange simple for, it would be so accurate, is I want you to be innocent when it comes to evil. I don't want you to lose your innocence. Now, I, I've mentioned this before, uh, in times past. But that's, a, that, that's a powerful concept. That being simple, we're removing ourselves from, the influ- from any of the influences of the world, from all of the influences of the world, and we're not allowing ourselves to be defiled. And that word defiled means to be, means to be stained by the world or by the past or by sin. But when it comes to evil, we've chosen simplicity. We've chosen, we've guarded our hearts and our lives. We've chosen innocence. God, no matter where you've been in your life, can restore back to you and I our innocence. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter what actions we've done. It doesn't matter what sins we've committed. It doesn't matter what, what, what uh, evil that we've been a part of or that we've partnered with, right? Once we come to him and we sing about it because of the power of his blood, because of the washing of his blood, because of the sacrifice of the cross, because of the finished work of Jesus, when we come to him, Everything that's been done previously is completely already been paid for. He throws it into a sea called forgetfulness and God restores back to us our innocence. We can live and walk and pray and sing and interact with the world around us as men and women who are innocent of the past evil. Only God can do that, but he does that. He promises us. Does that make sense, everybody? And then once that happens, he says, I want you to be intentional in the way that you live so that you are protecting your innocence. Let me give you a symptom of losing that innocence or not being simple. One way that somebody, you you can identify that is, well, there's several ways, but here's one, for example. One way is people who have lost their innocence, who are not being simple regarding those things that are evil, who are allowing all this stuff to get intermingled, the impurities of all that are still somehow intermingled. One characteristic, one symptom of that is just the way that we view everyone else around us. Paul talks about, Paul references it this way. He talks about evil suspicions. So one of the ways that you and I can identify if I lost my simplicity, if I lost my innocence, somehow 
as I'm doing life and I'm following Jesus, have I compromised in some area of my life or have I allowed the sin of others to defile me, to stain me, and as a result, have I, am I just, do I, am, am I just suspicious all the time? You know what I mean by that? Jaded. I'd like to believe that he's telling the truth. I don't know that I do. Well, has he ever lied to you? No. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, there are some folks, they just walk around, they're suspicious of everybody all the time. They just are. And, and, and it's difficult to live that way because it doesn't matter what the people around us do. Even if what they're doing isn't wronging us, we interpret it as a slight or as an offense or something that's wrong. And I'm telling you, that's a symptom of somebody who's not being simple concerning the things that are evil. They've lost their innocence. They're jaded. They have a constant suspicion going all the time around about everybody and everything. Are you, does anybody know what I'm talking about? That, I'm just saying that's one characteristic. And, I've, and I've, I've said this to before as well, but I've seen, I've seen people in their 20s who were jaded. And I think you're way too young to be jaded. But either, because, either one of two things have happened. They've not been simple they've not guard, guard, guarded their hearts they've uh, they've they've allowed the impurities of the world to be a part of their life or they've allowed the sin of others that impacted them they've allowed that to steal them of, from their innocence to rob their innocence and so they're defiled and Paul said, look, there's just, there's too many opportunities if we're committed to him and surrendered to him and we're living for him and we're pursuing him. There's not any way that you and I aren't going to be tempted by the things of the world and there's not any way we're not going to be impacted by the sin of others. And Paul says, if you lose your innocence if you're no longer simple regarding the things that are evil, then that same evil will conquer you. But if you're wise and skillful concerning what is good, in other words, if you allow, if you don't allow your heart to be defiled. Are you following what I'm saying? Let me give you another verse that uh, t talks about this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. There's a way that another character or another uh, symptom of that defilement, according to Hebrews chapter 12, is just bitterness or unforgiveness. Evil suspicion that constant suspicious outlook, interpreting pretty much anything and everything as a potential slight or an offense. And then we feel justified and we carry that offense and then it leads to what the scriptures call here as, as bitterness and then that bitterness defiles us, it stains us, it marks us. And so what Paul is saying here in Romans 16 is that it's possible to be marked or stained by unforgiveness. It's possible to be stained by lust. It's possible to be stained by fear. It's possible to pick up the stain of anger. It's possible to be stained with greed. And Paul is saying you can't afford any of that. I, I'm, I'm commanding you. I'm imploring you to be simple regarding those evil things. But here's... He, Here's the challenge, is that we can't in ourselves properly interpret that. We're talking about this word simple, talking about impurities like you find in, 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 in metals, gold or silver. And you don't always see the impurities 
in gold or silver. You don't, with the eye, you can't always, you don't always, you don't see all of the impurities that are there. It's the same with our own hearts and our own lives. And with ourselves uh, dependent upon us, we're not able to pick up or recognize those impurities that defile us, that stain us. We, we can't see them. There's literally no way for us to find them or even recognize them. Most of the time, ladies and gentlemen, we don't even know they're there. That's why the way they bring purity to the gold or silver is they place it under a fire where that metal begins to melt. So the fire melts the metal and the impurities rise to the top and then the one who is purifying that metal, he scrapes off the impurities that reveal themselves as a result of the fire. So the other thing that Paul is saying here is when he says, be simple in regards to evil, that word again, simple, is referring to or referencing that process, that purging, that refining process of the fire of God and the fire of the Holy Spirit that begins to, that begins to burn through us and begins to melt everything in us so that everything that isn't of God begins to rise to the top where it can actually be seen so God can, can, can begin to remove that from our lives. So we see it and and we take our hands off of it, like I talked about with the obedience. Okay, God, I don't want any of that in me. I didn't even know that was there. And there's stuff in us we don't even know it's there, guys. Sometimes your friends know. Sometimes your parents know. Because you go to them and go, man, I didn't even know that was in my life. And I'm like, well, we knew. Why didn't anybody tell me? We did. And you got mad. You weren't ready to hear it. But then there's this work of the Holy Spirit. There's the furnace of God that comes to our lives where we surrender our lives to the work of the fire of the Spirit of God. The fire of God that begins to burn through all of that stuff and reveal all of the impurities and begin to sift through all of that. And He begins to purify our lives. He begins to remove all of that stuff that defiles us and stains us. That causes us to become victims to the work of evil or the enemy, but through that work of the fire of God, he causes us to be victors instead of victims. He lifts us up beyond that. That stuff doesn't have a hold of us anymore. We're not marked by it. We're not stained by it. Even when we describe how we were, people look at us and go, there's no way you were that way. Now that's what I want. I don't want to describe my past and people go, yeah, I can see that. I don't want that. <laughs> right? And, what, and God doesn't want that. And what God does is he does such a work in our lives by the fire of his spirit. That's why it says you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and with fire, John baptized with water. But there's one coming who's greater than John the Baptist and he says he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, we need that fire baptism, right? We need the baptism, we need the infilling, but I need the fire of God as well. Because I wanna be able to say, well, what, what, where did he bring you from? Well, he brought me from that. And people look at you and go, there's no way you ever did that. Why do they say that? Because there's no stain. There's no defilement. There's no impurities. Are we perfect? No. But we've been through the fire, the furnace of God, and he's purified our hearts. Amen. And what happens is, is the stuff that had a grip on us, that had a hook in us before, doesn't have that hook anymore. Amen? The stuff that used to be successful bait that would always trip us up doesn't affect us anymore. Does that make sense, everybody? 
Here's what it says in Malachi chapter three. See, here's a, we, well, I'll say this, Malachi chapter three, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. Malachi chapter three, here's what it says. He will sit, he will sit, God will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like gold and silver so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. There is a, there is a refining that God does in our lives. There's a purifying that he does in our lives. It's like, the, it says right here, like the refining of gold and silver. Why? So that we may always offer an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. That what I'm offering him isn't stained by unforgiveness or bitterness. That what I'm offering him isn't stained with greed or lust. That what I'm offering him isn't stained with fear or cowardice. That what I'm offering him isn't a divided heart, but it's a heart that's been united to fear his name. That what I'm offering to him is an acceptable offering because I'm allowing the furnace, the fire, fire of God to refine my heart, to, to purge all that stuff, all of the impurities out because he's the only one that can do it. We can't afford to avoid that. Does that make sense, everybody? That he's doing that work in us. In First Peter, Peter talks about our faith being purified through the fire of trial through the fire of adversity. Is it the hardship or the adversity or the bad things or the tough stuff that refines us? In 1 Peter, Peter says that our faith is, ref our faith is refined as we go through difficulties. It's the fire of, of, of adversity or, or persecution. But actually, really, is it just the persecution or the adversity that refines us? That removes all the impurities? No. Why do I say that? Because there's a lot of people that go through tough stuff. There's a lot of people that go through adversity and they, they, they don't look any more like Jesus afterwards than they did before. They're not any different. Matter of fact, they go from crisis to crisis, adversity to, to adversity, most of which are, they bring on themselves. No, as, as we're going through it, Peter is saying, there's a work of the Holy Spirit and it's a refining work. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. It's the fire of God. It's the furnace of God that no matter what we're going through, God may not have author, authored that, but he's using that for his glory. And he says, I didn't cause this to come to you. This is the enemy coming for your faith. But as he's coming for your faith, I'll make sure your faith is greater refined so that at the end of it, your faith is stronger, not weaker. Your faith isn't shipwrecked. Your faith is strong, stronger than it's ever been because there's less impurities in your soul. Amen. Does that make sense? Well, that just requires, a that just requires you and I to just be surrendered to that. And it starts with us just being obedient to that. Just being willing to say yes. Just be willing to surrender. Just be willing to respond.